Okay. I have got a few slides to share. We are going to look at my CV and have a little look at my creative journey because I know some people like that. They like that kind of career pathway stuff and how did you get to where you are now? So let's have a little look at this. Let's have a look at my CV. So I left Lippa, Liverpool Institute of Performing Arts in 2005, which is a long time ago now. Um, I did the community arts course. So I trained in kind of how to deliver workshops and arts projects with people out in the community. Uh, people of all ages, children, adults, elderly people, people in um, prisons, young offenders institutes, people in hospital. So it was quite a varied course to begin with. And I think that set me up quite well for what came later. Like I said, I started off teaching children drama and street dance. And what that doesn't say on the timeline is that at that point, I'm not earning enough to support myself independently or whatever. At this point, 2005, 2006, I am living in my mum and dad's house. And anyone who's done that after going to university and having all that freedom knows how much that sucks to have to go back and live with your parents for a bit. The good news. In 2006, I escaped and moved back to Manchester um, to start doing an MA. And I'm kind of funding that by teaching at a weekend drama school, um, like, you know, like stagecoach, theatre arts, that kind of thing, where rich parents send their children to do drama, dance and singing. Um, I'm also a youth theatre teacher and I'm a nursery assistant while I'm doing my MA as well. 2008. So 2008, summer 2008, I set up all the skills with a friend and it's like an arts workshop agency, delivers performing arts workshops and creative arts workshops to predominantly schools and community groups but sometimes a little bit of corporate work as well. Um, so we started that up in kind of like July 2008 have no idea what's coming late that year but obviously as some of you will know later that year October 2008 big financial crash and the economy plummets and we're just like crap this is the worst time ever to set up a business what have we done um so none of that's kind of you know not gonna have as much income as what we thought I would. Um, I also work as a person assistant for disabled women, um, just supporting them to live independently in their homes. Um, so, you know, a very unglamorous non arts job, literally wiping bums, bathing people, um, doing their washing, cleaning, whatever. But what is good about that job, the PA work, is I can work like seven days, seven to ten days in a row, earn a thousand pounds or so in like one week and then it gives me all the freedom the rest of the time to do like the arts jobs to do the workshops and all the things with all the skills so it works out quite well in that way okay a few pictures from the all the skills days back in the day so we did a lot of circus skills my partner at the time was really into circus skills you can see me there doing stilt walking and event and bolt in um I used to do a lot more dance than I do now. So in the corner, there's me sort of doing a Charleston dance workshop at a museum and like a 1920s day. Um, I exploited my Chinese-ness for all it was worth. And at like Chinese New Year, going to schools and do workshops about like Chinese culture, do fan dance, fan painting, tell traditional like Chinese stories. Um, just kind of using whatever we had, whatever skills we had and putting them into the business to try and be as diverse and appeal to as many different people as possible. I mentioned this at the start, I do a lot of medical role play for universities and trainee doctors. Started off working at Manchester University, but then got kind of more experienced and started working with Leeds and Liverpool as well as some private companies. And what's great about the private companies and private role play um, is that they pay really well for a day's work so if you are a performer of any kind 
like you know you can act relatively convincingly like I'm not an actor I would never call myself an actor but role play is so scripted and the briefs are so clear that I think a lot of people are probably able to do it so I think it's a really good way of making money the work's quite regular because it's always doctors and medical students they're always going to need training they're always going to have exams so I think it's quite a good thing into and they are particularly on the lookout for kind of non-white um, role players to kind of bring more of that diversity that the doctors and the medical students do in the community kind of into the university setting. Um, a lot of the actors, the role players still tend to be white. So if you are of the not white persuasion and like performing, it's a good thing to get into. So yeah, I mentioned the financial crash of 2008 and how that kind of buggered up our business plans a little bit. So in 2010, like I said, 2009 was like our best year ever. Then things kind of went downhill on the self-employed side for a bit. So in 2010, I took a part-time role, salaried role, proper employed by a company um, at Oldham Coliseum. So I worked there for three days a week. It was a nice regular job to keep me going for a year. <clears throat> but still did all the skills at the weekends and some of the school's workshops. And I'm still doing PA work as well. Here's a, here's a little hint from Naomi. Don't mix business with pleasure. So I was working with my boyfriend, McKay, to do all the skills. We broke up in 2012 and that has quite a big impact on business. We just like, we cannot we can't work together, we can't be together, what now? So I applied for a full-time job as community engagement officer at the Lawrence Batley Theatre in Huddersfield. I was already working there as a youth theatre tutor and this just felt like a good time to kind of get a proper full-time job. My whole sort of business, personal life, everything had kind of fallen apart on me. So this was just about very much steadying the boat and making my life as simple and as easy and secure as possible. But what the job also gave me apart from that was experience in admin skills and project management and a little bit of producing. Whereas before I'd been very, very much on the workshop delivery side. In this job, I learned admin skills as well, which I've then taken and used moving forward. Um, in 2013, I start writing for the stage just because I've watched people kind of at work doing writing workshops and playwriting workshops thought oh that looks interesting I'll give that a go just having a dabble really just having a play but then I had an existential crisis at the end of 2013 um, and quit my full-time salaried job because I felt I'd kind of got everything from it that I wanted. The next step up was being the manager of an education department, which was a lot of spreadsheets and funding applications and sitting at a desk. And I didn't really want to do that. So I was like, do you know what? Fuck it, I'm leaving. Um, but I didn't totally quit and kind of leave myself with nothing. I'm not that insane. I'm still working. Oh my God, how am I doing this? I'm still working as a personal assistant. I still freelance for the theatre as a youth theatre tutor and I still do medical role play. So as you can see, I kind of gave myself things to fall back on. Even though I had a full-time job for a year or so, I'd built up enough contacts and things previously that it was okay to leave my job and it wasn't quite a crazy move as you might initially think and then quite fortunately quite soon after leaving my full-time job I was offered a slot at the Manchester 24-7 theatre festival um, which back in the day was quite a good showcase for writers and actors um, it had quite a good reputation and it kind of set me up as a playwright it gave me producing experience because the writers have to produce their own play at this festival or like find someone who can help them do that. So I basically just worked with a more experienced producer who knew what they were doing to put on kind of this play, this festival. It was on for a week and people started going, okay, maybe this person, maybe this Naomi is like a writer to watch in the future. 
um, after doing 24 seven, a few years later, I'm still doing all the other things like UCA teaching, PA work, et cetera. Um, but then I got Arts Council funding for the first time to produce and tour um, a play called One Flesh as part of LGBT History Month. Um, it's about same-sex marriage basically within the Christian church, um, kind of based a little bit on my personal experiences. I draw a lot on my own life and kind of what I've gone through personally in my work. Um, always making the most of me and my experiences and what I know. 2016, July 2016, set up a new writing company called Brushstroke Order. It was half to kind of produce my own work under that theatre company label, but also as a company to support other emerging playwrights or people who write for performance. So we do workshops, we do kind of mentoring sessions for playwrights who are kind of quite early on in their career, do production supports and online workshops and things. Oh, and script reading service. So people can send their scripts into me. I read and do a script report and feedback on their work as well. At this point, I really, really want to move away from working in participation, youth theatre, community engagement, that side of things, and do want to work more in new writing. So in 2017, I did the National Theatre's Step Change Programme. And that was just a year of really trying something new they kind of set up um placements at different places so did a placement at the national theater studio with their dramaturgs doing script reading looking at plays from the like the plays beyond the western canon basically that might be suitable for production um on the national theater stage i also did some work at live theater in newcastle which is another theatre that specialises in new writing. Um, so going from having really broad experience, like working at a really big um, organisation like The National, and then going to somewhere like Live Theatre, which is a really, really tiny venue, and finding out how things work there and how they support writers in the North East, um, which is a very, very different place and set up and ecology to the London scene. And then that led to um, freelance script reading so i started doing that at the end of 2017 for the nt and then moved on to do work for the royal exchange sheffield theater i've also read for the papa tango playwriting competition and theater 503 and some of the smaller london fringe venues as well um last year produced Same Same Different, was commissioned by Eclipse Theatre that some of you guys might know and have heard of. Um, so took that out on a regional tour to 10 venues across the north of England. And then I've just done my very first digital project, which is hilarious because I'm so untechnical, as you might have guessed from how this PowerPoint is going now. Um, so I was commissioned by Home Theatre and Chinese Arts Now to do a project um, via Instagram and a blog um, telling the fictional story of a transracial, Chinese transracial adoptee who's kind of triggered by coronavirus and everything that's happening in Wuhan to try and trace her birth parents. And it's a very, very fictionalized version of myself. The character of Jasmine is kind of an imaginary version of me because I was adopted from Hong Kong into a white British family so I was kind of drawing on that experience of me being adopted and growing up in quite a white world and wondering and having thoughts about like who my birth parents are to kind of put that project together. Oh, 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 no, we've gone too far. Okay. I'm going to get you guys to talk, actually. You might have seen this little sneaky peek of that next slide there. But I kind of wanted to throw it over to you guys, to the group, and ask you, what you think the benefits of being like a multifaceted artist and having lots of different skills might be how is that an advantage to be able to do lots of different things oh here we go got questions really reassuring to know that leaving a job isn't a bad thing no what's a bad thing is staying in a job because you feel you have to or because you're scared to leave you can leave a job and because you have to survive, you have to do something 
and because I think everyone in this group who's here tonight is a creative person who you know will find solutions to life no leaving a job even a full-time salaried decently paid one isn't always a bad thing Paul has asked did you apply for the opportunities or were you invited um a bit of a mix Paula to be honest um so for step change I applied and actually I applied in 2014 to do step change and got rejected um but then I just came back and tried again I kind of knew a bit more about what the application process was used that to my advantage to then lead to a successful application in 2017 um 24-7 theatre festival again it's application you'd like write your play you submit it and kind of the panel of judges read it and kind of decide if you're going to be selected or not. Um, other things I was invited to do. So I think because I did impress people when I was on placement at the NT studio, then I was invited to be on their script readers panel. And then because people know them, they've invited me. Um, so Theatre 503 was kind of like um, Gillian Greer, who used to work at the NT studio, also used to work at 503, and she kind of recommended me as a reader for that one. But then I applied to read for Papa Tango and had to sit their reader's test. So it's a real, real mix of both things. Um, more about the role play in medicine. Hi, Naomi. Hello. So you wanted to know about medical role play? Yeah, I was interested in that because yeah. I know it's difficult for... Uh, There's literally a company students. called Medical Role Players UK. I'm typing in the chat. Okay, yeah. Because in, uh, in, in Asia, in India and Malaysia, you get plenty of patients. So students have an opportunity to do the clinical examination and the rest. But here it can be a bit hard. Yeah. So what sort of role plays you played that was interesting for me? What kind of thing? It's really, really varied. Like literally like in any condition, medical condition, um, really. So you're just like given a brief of the symptoms and kind of what to mm. say. And then they kind of have to diagnose you or just have a conversation to explain something to you. So yeah, a role that, you know, that, play a lot just kind of like a mum who's got a baby and they just have to explain like immunizations to you but then the more interesting okay. ones are like the psychiatric ones where oh. you're like you're seeing a blackbird and the blackbird's talking to you um so that's kind of like the higher levels like more like year five doctors who are going to practice really really soon um but yeah all sorts of things Very the world plays are really thank varied you, thank you. you're welcome um Benefits. Oh, okay. People are answering my questions about what the benefits of being a multi-faceted artist are. So yeah, making relationships with institutions you want to work for, maybe in a different capacity, being able to take a different job currently available. Yeah. Does anyone else have anything to say about what the benefits are of being a multi multifaceted person or what the advantages are of being able to turn your hand to lots of different things? I think personally for me, if I may say something is I, I was with med 100% in the medical profession, but also trained in classical Indian dance and music. I also do copper tooling and write, but it helped me to bring health and arts projects together. A lot of, um, using arts for various types of uh, health issues, as well as for uh, disabilities, like learning disabilities, and also for hearing impairment, uh, children with hearing impairment. I used a lot of hand gestures of Indian dance to do storytelling, and they relate well with Makaton like but huh? we do that sort of a thing. And for people with visual handicap, I've done tactile dancing and handicap, visual handicap. Wow. So I think that's sort of a creative writing for people with mental health issues. And of course, movement and that sort of thing for physical and things. So I think it's an advantage when we have the two together. And if you can switch from 
just pure dancing to music or creative writing. It really helps sometimes. That's a fantastic way of bringing your different skills together. Yeah. Like using the hand gestures, the way of communicating yeah. and how it relates to the Makaton. I think that's fascinating. That's really cool. I mean, it's just written. It definitely feels like there's no such job as, can't even read today. There's no such a job for life anymore. So being able to adapt and act accordingly seems like a massive asset. Yep, absolutely. Um, yeah, I don't think there's like job security, really. Um, maybe in a few industries, but definitely not the arts. Um, so yeah, being able to adapt, really important. And I think people are adapting, like we've seen over the past few months with the COVID situation, whatever, what some of our colleagues are doing and turning their hands to over the past few months shows that kind of adaptability. Leon says, I probably wouldn't get any work on if I wasn't able to produce it and do anything that's needed as part of that. So it's helped me be able to do some other stuff. That's true. Yeah. A lot of writers who maybe don't want to produce or are scared of producing and are just putting all their hopes on like a playwriting competition or sending it into a theatre that magically says yes. Um, you know, being able to produce your own work is a massive benefit because it gets your work out there. You have something to show people, you have something to invite people from theatres, programmers, artistic directors to come and see. And it shows that you're proactive, I think, as well. And it does give you those skills that then you can use either to promote your own career or support other people as another source of income. So yeah, being able to self-produce as an artist, whether you're a dancer, musician, playwright, whatever, is a really good skill to have. And if you don't have those skills now, find someone who does to mentor you. That's what I did. Or co-produce with someone, like the same, same different. I already had some producing skills, but was handling a big budget, much, much bigger than I'd ever had before. Uh, it was the kind of touring and sort of taking actors out on the road with me. I hadn't really done that side of things before. So I basically just got someone who was, you know, two or three steps ahead of me um, in terms of where they're at in their career. And they just kind of, sounds really awful. <laughs> they literally sometimes held my hand through it. Um, and also find someone who's kind of good at the stuff that you're not. I'm not very confident with numbers. Spreadsheets and Excel and all that scares me. So find someone who's kind of good at the stuff that you're not and make a partnership that kind of complements each other. Yeah. So what do we have? I think people have said all of these. More opportunities to work and meet new people. Financially more secure. I wrote that. I don't know how much I believe that really. I think what I mean is more that you have more options um, in terms of where you might earn money. In terms of actual security, I don't know, but maybe you have more choice about where you could work, maybe. Um, I do believe this next one, though. I do believe that work creates work. I think if you're kind of out there, getting your name known, people see you doing something, they go, oh, okay, that was interesting. It kind of puts you in people's minds when they're looking for people. If you're kind of not doing anything or you're under the radar, or you're just sitting in front room watching Netflix, it's much, much harder, I think, to suddenly go out and get a job. And then working in lots of different areas, lots of different fields, I think gives you a wide network of places where people might kind of do referrals for you. It's a wide network of support. Um, yeah, basically, you're not just in like one little bubble, you're part of a wider network of people who can help you to find work or who'll support you when times are tough. I can't imagine what it's like now, all the people that kind of graduated this year from university or drama school or whatever, who haven't had the time to build up and establish contacts um, that they can draw on in tough times. I'm very lucky that I've been able to build up a network of things and lots of different options for myself over the years. Another really good advantage, even if you decide, actually, I've tried lots of different things, I can do lots of different things, but actually I am just going to focus on 
being a poet, being a playwright, being an actor, if you've tried things and understand different job roles, it gives you an understanding of what the other people in your team are trying to do, what they're trying to achieve, what their job role is. And it kind of gives you a shorthand so you're able to communicate and share your ideas, I think, better and more coherently. And you understand the other person's responsibilities and you can help them in a way that you might not be able to do if you don't really understand what their job involves. So even if after trying a few different things, you're like, actually, no, I am going to focus on one different thing. I still think there's benefit to it. Okay, I think I'm going to move on to activity now. So, you will need for this a pen or piece of paper or write into a computer, phone notes, whatever. Just be able to write somehow. I would like you to make a list of your skills knowledge and experience it doesn't have to be arts related it can be like medical knowledge it can be like knowledge of makaton if you know things like that minibus license really good life saving like lifeguard skills a list of your sort of skills knowledge experience i'll give you about five minutes to do that but what i might do so you're not kind of just floundering around in the dark completely is I might just show you what's on my list when I did it. So you kind of get an idea of the things that I'm talking about. So just a bit of an example of things I do. And some of those are purely hobbies, like I'm not brilliant at yoga. Dear God, I would not want any of you to see me doing yoga. But just list down hobbies, interests, skills, experiences. It can be things you know, or things you like to do, things you're interested in. If you've got a few things on your list, you can move on to the next stage, which is circling the ones or if you've written on your phone, I don't know how you do it, but just note somehow what you think you could actually get people to pay you for. Which things on your list could you actually monetize? Like I said, I'm not going to be monetizing my yoga anytime soon. And some of those things that you circle might be arts or creative industries related. Some of them might not be, and that's perfectly okay. Any way to make money is a good way to make money. I kind of hesitated halfway through that because obviously, as we know, there are certain things people do to make money which are not good things. I'm not promoting illegal activities here. Because like baking, you might be really good at making cakes, so you might be someone who can charge people for making their birthday cakes or something like that or you might be able to play the violin and teach other people that and then if you're ready you just put a star or somehow make a different note of which things on your list might be useful working in the arts or creative industries so if you're able to do video editing and stuff you might be able to make the trailer for a show if you are able to drive a minibus or some kind of hgv that's a really useful skill and what i say is that if you've planned a wedding or a big kind of family event you can probably produce a performance wedding planning is very much like putting on a show i think
I am going to show you a thing one way, Naomi, definitely, apart from yoga, should not make money. Okay, yeah. Cooking, not how I'm going to make money. That, my friends, is a moussaka. Yeah. It's like some kind of alien life form, isn't it? Now, I like cooking. I like eating. But it's not, you know, there's no way I could charge someone any kind of money for that monstrosity. Okay. Um, I'm going to move on to verbatim theatre now. So like I said before, I make a lot of work drawing on my own experience. Um, and I've made one verbatim show and I'm in the process of making another. So the one I toured last year, Same Same Different, was about transracial adoption um, and what it's like to kind of grow up um, as a person of colour in like a white community. And the reason why I wanted to make it a verbatim play is that for adoptees, very often our stories are told for us because we're children when we're adopted. So our parents kind of tell our stories a lot for us. And then <clears throat> by the time we grow up and can tell our own story, um, it's kind of becomes a version or we just repeat kind of our parents' version of events. So I wanted to give adoptees the chance to tell their stories and share their experiences in their own words to amplify kind of their voice and their side of the story. Um, and then the show that I'm making now is about three generations of military children because kind of that's my background as well. I grew up, my dad was in the army, I grew up living all over the world. Um, my dad was a military kid and then my granddad was a military kid as well. <clears throat> so I wanted to look at how that experience has changed, but also look at <clears throat> life in the armed forces from a different perspective through the eyes of a child and very often stories about the army or the armed forces focus very much on male veterans so I just wanted to give other people who are affected by military life a voice as well. So verbatim theatre is theatre made from real people's words, it's a form of documentary theatre and it lets people explore events kind of through the words and through the eyes of people who've experienced those things. Um, usually it's created from interviews with people, although I think there are versions where people use transcripts and court documents or things from the newspaper and magazines, interviews as well. Sometimes people use written text, but I think the best verbatim work generally um, comes from interviews although I don't know if anyone else saw kind of during lockdown breach theatres um play it's true it's true it's true which was using court documents been a really live interesting way to explore kind of rape culture and consent based on oh god I can't remember the artist's name which is really, really annoying if someone remembers it please do say um, but she was saying that basically she was sexually assaulted by by a fellow artist and they were just like well no because you have loads of men come and visit you in your room you paint lots of men you could be doing you know you could be doing all sorts with everybody um because the artist that she was accusing was a person of very high standing high status well respected so they're just like nah why should we believe you there we go. So that's a definition from out of joint theatre there. Um, I'm short on time, so I'm going to let you read about different verbatim practitioners in your own time. Um, lots of different ways of doing it, lots of different methods of making verbatim theatre. You can look at those in your own time and research them. I'm moving on to the good stuff. So I know some of you in the group, I think, are making verbatim work, making biographical work at the moment and I think when it comes to choosing a subject for your verbatim show it's about kind of showing people a hidden world that they wouldn't normally be able to access what do you know that other people don't know 
or like maybe you're part like unorthodox on netflix that gave people an insight into what it's like um living as a very orthodox jewish woman for example or maybe you've had a really unique life experience that's shared by only a handful of people like maybe you survived a shark attack and you and other people who survive shark attacks kind of get together talk and make a show about your experience other people choose a big historic moment so you might make a play where you explore um 9 11 from people's different perspectives maybe the emergency services maybe people who were in the offices that day um people who were bereaved by that event maybe there's a part of history that just has a personal relevance or resonance for you or you might be really passionate about a certain issue you might be really like um want to explore what anti-semitism means in the uk today or you might be like you know billionaires they shouldn't exist in a moral society and you might sort of want to make a show about that interview people you might find a billionaire to interview who's like defends their position and then other people who are like really against it and are like no they should be billionaires they have no place in our world today the best subjects are ones where people aren't going to agree and they'll be on both sides of the argument some people will be like oh yeah veganism is the way to go and that's what's going to save the world whereas other people are like well actually a lot of vegan products aren't as environmentally friendly as you'd think um meat is important and um, the dairy industry you know has a lot of employees what are they going to do for work pick something that's kind of where people can debate and argue in the interval and while you might have really strong feelings about an issue or a question try not to preach at your audience ask them a genuine question and one that can't be answered just for the simple yes or no answer so the central question for same same different my adoption play was what makes you you and it's kind of looking at the whole nature nurture kind of thing because i was going i'm nothing like my adoptive family or i think i'm nothing like my adoptive family so who am i like how did i end up being the person who i am today what's influenced my personality and my character. Once you've decided what you're going to make a show about, you then have to think, well, who do you need to interview? So if, for example, we were going to make a play about the Beirut explosion, the explosion that's happened in Beirut just this past week, who might we need to talk to? or who might you want to talk to if you're going to make a play about that experience and also once you decided who you're going to talk to what questions might you want to ask them oh that's what i'm saying okay so yeah let's do a little group thing for five minutes or so if we were making a show about the beirut bomb no, it wasn't a bomb. Why did I say bomb? It's an explosion. They're storing explosives incorrectly. That's what it was. Um, who would we need to interview and what might we ask them? So, Jesse, people who were there, I would say people who were responsible for it. Yeah, oh my God, the shame of it. Um, MPs, yeah. Those who saw the explosion, those who lost someone. Yeah, I think that'd be really poignant, someone who lost someone. People who were working there. Yeah, government officials. Cool. And what might you want to ask those people? Wait, no, who do we want to talk to you now? What questions might you want to ask? And obviously it's gonna be different, isn't it? The question you ask a government official is gonna be different from what you ask someone who lost someone in the incident. Mm -hmm. Oh, a really wide open question to start things off from Paula. What the experience of the event was. What now? Really good question from Emily. 
Yeah. Because it's a country that's on the edge anyway, and this event is just like sort of tipped it over into fuck knows what. How has this changed your life? Really good question. Really nice open question that, you know, we'll get a lot of different answers, I think, depending on who you talk to. Mm. Yeah, people have family there. What could have been different? Oh my God, that's such a big question. Deep, big, deep questions, yeah. Yeah. What I suggest, oh, who do you blame? Uh, we're going in. Guys, these are great questions. What I suggest though, is at the start of your interviews, when you go out and interview people, is have some nice, easy, kind of not too confrontational questions, like some of the ones that are there, just to begin with, to get people talking. And then once people are kind of feeling relaxed, they're talking in a flow, then kind of go in with the harder, tougher questions. Um, if you ask something kind of too, um, too difficult or too challenging early on, it can shut people down and you don't get that lovely, rich, verbatim material that has real depth and humanness and admits flaws and weaknesses and all that kind of stuff. Um, you're more likely to get a much more performed, robotic, whatever answer. And that's not really what we're looking for in verbatim. In verbatim, we're looking for those real, honest, human kind of moments. Oh, that's a really good question from Carlza there. Can anything good come from this terrible event? God, you guys are good. I'm loving this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Cool. I'm going to return to my PowerPoint now because I can't remember what comes next. Oh, we touched on our open questions. Yeah. Experience, opinions, and feelings. Verbatim is about more of that stuff than facts. We can get facts off the newspaper, off surveys, off official government documents. You're looking for the human, the human aspect of any situation or thing that you're exploring. So you go out, you do your interviews, you ask some really good questions, you end up with hours and hours and hours of material. And if you're anything like me, because you're passionate about the subject, you're passionate about what you're doing, you will think that everything is interesting. It's not. An audience will not agree with you. Edit, edit, and then edit some more. I think a common problem with a lot of verbatim work made by inexperienced practitioners is that they will just present a load of information via a character who's kind of talking like a talking head, who's literally standing there and talking to the audience, delivering a load of factual information. You need to somehow take your material and create a story. There needs to be a structure to it so that the audience go on some kind of journey with you, just like they do in any, not any, in most kind of theatre, film, television, programs they need to go on a journey through this event through this research not just be told a lot of facts yeah. so if we're making our Beirut explosion play for example we might do things chronologically so we order our research um, and kind of how the stories are told like from kind of the morning, what happened that morning, <clears throat> what people were expecting to happen that day, then first signs of things going wrong, the explosion itself, events immediately after, um, so kind of trying to get away from burning buildings, smoke filling the air, panicking that your friend, relative, whatever, might have been caught up in it, the realisation that maybe someone has lost somebody and then wanting to blame someone for this attack. Who are we going to blame? 
and then working towards some of those things that people mentioned like can anything good come out of this what happens next so there's some kind of order to things so it's not just here's a load of facts and here's someone else telling us a whole other load of facts or something about something if it's not an event a historical event or things but it's more like a subject like prostitution and should that be legalized in the uk you might want to set things out as argument counter argument and go back and forward a little bit like a tennis match or a boxing match or something like that and then have some kind of summing up or resolution or victory at the end oh this is what i said before be careful of your verbatim play not becoming a series of talking heads where characters just sit or stand and you know give information out to the audience find ways to make the show visually interesting and find ways to share information visually as well as verbally same 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 different we had a screen and we shared some things on the screen as well or had a lot of video moments so it wasn't just actors doing direct address to the audience all the time and then what I tried to do as well, um, on recommendation from my dramaturg, um, so Philip Osmond, who passed away actually last year, was a dramaturg on this. And he was like, audiences like to watch behaviour. So even if it's verbatim and it feels really interviewy, if you can recreate kind of the interview setup as much as possible, um, so there were like several little scenes where it was just like okay we're in someone's front room and the kids running around and someone's made muffins and you know the twins are kind of bantering off against each other if you can show that behavior as well as the words and kind of the interesting story that they're going to share um that is good i'm going to move on now because some people want to talk about the ethics of making verbatim work and I think that's really important because you are dealing with real people's words and with that comes quite a lot of responsibility really here we go so what I've done in both of my verbatim shows is kind of I put a call out for people who might want to take part in an interview and then I send them a document that kind of goes, okay, this is how and where your stories will be shown. They'll be shown in the theatre. Little bits might be shared online in vlogs or in kind of social media posts. I might put like an interesting quote from our interview. Kind of how their words will be used. So whether it's going to be quite pure verbatim where you just kind of cut and paste extracts from an interview, but it's kind of literally as they've said it, or whether their words will be used um more as an inspiration for writing so it might not be pure verbatim it might be just be like oh i use this interview to create a more fictionalized story or lung theater kind of use verbatim in quite an interesting way where they really really do chop up the interviews and it's kind of like words here and there or sentences here and there that people have said in real life are really really cut and pasted together so it doesn't really represent the interviews as they happened and then also who is going to have access to those recordings and transcripts is it just going to be the creative team is anyone else going to be able to listen to what might be quite personal stories or information just let them know what to expect and make sure that they are okay with that and actually just get them to sign a consent form so they understand all of the above and they consent to be interviewed and that just kind of protects them and it protects you as well because it stops that really awful situation of you making a show and someone turning around and being like oh well no I didn't say that I wasn't involved in this this person's kind of lying or appropriating my life and then you're just like actually no you sent a consent form you said so it stops a lot of problems but also don't just do things once. After the interview, when you're writing things up, you're deciding which bits you're going to include in your final version. 
go back to your story contributor, to your interviewee, and get them to read it or read it to them and get them to sign off the final version of the words. Allow them to make edits, I think. Some people do, some people don't. I, I do let people edit things, as long as it feels real and in their voice and it's not like a performed thing or whatever, you know. I, people can disagree and I'd be interested to hear what people think about sort of getting people to change things after the initial interview, after the event. But I think these are real people, it's their story. They should have as much ownership and as much control and as much say as possible into what goes out into the public realm. Um, Jen Tang, another Chinese adoptee who makes work about adoption, um, kind of put stuff in about what their mum says and how the mum talks to them um but didn't show them that that's her choice it's her relationships how many what is a good number of people to interview for a, a verbatim piece oh my god i don't know because i think i'm going to be that really awful person that just turns around and goes <clears throat> it depends what you're making your show about yeah. um I just think you have to get a broad range of experiences. So people kind of on both sides of the argument or the issue. I would say, oh God, this is really broad. Again, I'd say at least half a dozen. I wouldn't go under that. I don't think you should make a verbatim show. Oh, I don't know, see. I say, I don't think you should make a verbatim show, which is a duologue. But actually, it depends what the thing, if it is about a mother-daughter relationship and how it went wrong, then it absolutely could be a duologue. If you're making it much more issue-based, I think at least half a dozen, but for same, same, different, I interviewed about 20 people overall. But some of those were families, so sometimes that was like four or five people interviewed together. Yeah. And then, if you want to be really super ethical and kind to people, if possible, um, invite them to a natural sharing. So it's one thing to read kind of a transcript or a scene of your words. It's another thing to see it acted out in front of you. Um, some of the adoptive parents I showed scenes of same, same, different to had quite a strong emotional reaction. Not a bad thing, but it would have been very, very difficult that the first time they saw their scenes and themselves kind of being played back to them. That's a bit of a weird experience for anyone. Um, it would have been quite embarrassing, quite awkward to just kind of sit with their friends in an audience watching it. So I've invited people into rehearsal rooms, showed them their scenes privately first and been like, is that okay for you? Is there anything you want to change? Is there anything you want to take out? If you have space for that, I think try and do it. But I do appreciate it's not possible all the time, depending on what who your interviewees are, the situations the interviews take place in, it might not be possible. Like people who are in like, you know, detention centre, people in care or things like that, it might not be so possible to do that. Um, really obvious one, which I think you guys would know anyway, but I'm gonna say it just to cover my own ass, and then I know that I've said it always interview children or vulnerable adults with a parent or guardian present or a chaperone just because you don't want to get into awkward sort of legal areas um or also just kind of getting people to talk about very very personal stuff in a way that they might not really want to talk about but feel that they have to because you're an adult you're an interviewer you've got a certain status that might make people want to please you or want to do kind of what you're saying even though it might not be the right thing for them that way a parent or chaperone can step in and be like actually i don't think it's a good idea for you to talk about that or actually no you can't talk about those things um depending on again what the issue is that you're exploring um yeah so, for example, with the armed forces, where the children, children's parents were currently 
um, still serving members of the armed forces, there's certain things <clears throat> that can't go out into the public realm because it might compromise their mum or their dad's position within the armed forces. Um, another nice thing to do, and sometimes you have to do, depending on who you're interviewing, is offer, I can't say the word, anonymity <laughs> or change names or place names so that people you know, can't be traced, can't be found, certain things can't come back to bite them or have a negative impact on them or their family. I mentioned military personnel just then, but also children in care settings or in criminal justice settings, you can't reveal their identity, who they really are to the general public. Okay, <clears throat> so that's kind of ethical things. But I know there are debates as well about verbatim theatre and just kind of how it can be open to exploitation a little bit. You as the theatre maker, the writer, practitioner, can be accused of exploiting sometimes vulnerable groups for your own benefit, your own career, your own ego. So here are some things to think about just to kind of counter some of those. So yeah, why are you telling this story? I don't think it's enough just to be interested in I don't know, asylum seekers, for example, if you're like a very privileged British, white, middle class British person who has no experience of the asylum system or a personal connection to it, I think you might want to ask yourself, why do you want to make this show? There might be a good reason, but just check yourself and know that people are going to ask you that question, like, who are you to talk about this? you need to have some kind of relationship to the subject matter or the group you're interviewing. So like I said, I've made the most of my experiences and what I know, I am a military kid. I am an adoptee. I feel qualified, justified, whatever, to make work about those experiences because it's something I've personally experienced myself. If you are making a show about a group you don't belong to or don't relate to in that way, really big question that people shy away from. Where's the money going? Admittedly, you need to pay for a show, you need to pay yourselves. But if there's profit, are you going to give back to a refugee charity? Are you going to donate to a women's shelter if you've been kind of interviewing victims of domestic violence? How can your show actually have benefit <clears throat> to the people that you've made it about? If it's not money, what are you offering? or giving the story contributors, the people that you're interviewing, what are they getting in return? Is it a chance to tell their story and no one's listened to them before? Are they being given a chance to put the record straight on something? What are you giving the people as well as taking from them? Um, something I just was thinking about, cause I just read um, the Clean Break play, the, what was it? It felt empty when the heart went at first, but it's okay now, which is about um, women who are trafficked into prostitution. And with those kind of stories, with those kind of experiences, those women have to tell their stories over and over and over again to the police, to social workers, um, and people who are trying to help them kind of escape that life. And obviously retelling the story brings up a lot of trauma, um, can end up reliving events, it can cause like PTSD and stuff like that. So just know that with some groups, depending on what you're interviewing them about, it can be a traumatic thing. Why should they repeat it all again for you? And if they choose to do that, then that is a privilege. Um, it's a privilege for you to hear that story. They are giving a lot of themselves and therefore, you know, you need to be respectful of that and also offer some kind of support if they're going to be talking about traumatic events you know are you able are they in a good enough place is the support are they living somewhere where they can't access counseling services are they you know are they living with a friend or some kind of care provider who can take care of them if they are going to slip back a little bit in their mental health um yeah so if you are if you are interviewing vulnerable people, and there's millions of different ways that people can be vulnerable, you might know more than me for your particular circumstances. 
just what support have you put in place um, or checked is in place? Don't just be like, oh, well, they've got a social worker, they'll figure it out. Make sure that you know what is there for the people you're interviewing. Okay. With verbatim theatre, it's all in the edit. So people think the verbatim theatre is somehow pure, authentic, raw, whatever, because it's people's real words. But it's always been edited to some extent, even if it's just that you've cut and pasted several sections out of an interview that you've done with someone. You, as the writer or theatre maker, or whatever, have enormous power as the editor. There's always some kind of lens or filter that we're looking through or that you've imposed somehow even without meaning to, you might want to or think you're presenting something as real as authentically and unfiltered as possible, but that just simply isn't true. There's always some kind of agenda behind our work. So as the writer or creator, you have power and responsibility, Spider-Man there, when it comes to real life people and how they're presented to strangers. You're not necessarily presenting, you know, things unfiltered, but you do need to make sure that people don't think they're being misrepresented or you're manipulating or twisting their words simply to fit your own agenda. Or know that you have an agenda and that it's just not pure. Don't lie to yourself. Okay. Are there any questions about what I've just said? Have you ever had a situation where somebody's come back to you and said, why have you, why have you done that? Why have you made me like that? Yes, but it was my parents. I actually interviewed my parents for same, same difference. And they want to talk about adoption and tell their adoption story or even my adoption story in a very particular way. Um, so when they read back what they'd said or how I'd edited and sort of presented the scene, they were like, you've made us look like idiots. And I'm like, that wasn't my intention. It's just literally kind of, these are the words that you said. And then they wanted to change things and edit things a lot. And I know I said before about let people edit, let people rewrite. But what... I didn't let my mom do all the edits that she wanted to because it came across as very written and very performed and fake. And I felt it would do even more damage to her than having the words as she actually spoke them at the time. Because I was like, mom, it sounds really fake. And then people will be suspicious. It sounds inauthentic. So you might feel that you're putting your best, your best face on. And this is what you want to tell. But actually, because it's a mix of you speaking real authentically in the moment, and there's a little bit, you know, two sentences tacked on that you've written and thought about really, really hard. It just sounds really weird and really awkward. Mm. I thought I could do that because it's me ma'am. With other people, I might have let it go and gone, okay, yeah, you can have that one. Betsy, you've just seen a camera on. Do you want to say something? Yes, please. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask what your opinion would be on um, kind of like making work about social issues or issues that affect everyone basically um in terms of obviously it's really important to get a lot of quite a big sample of people and to get people from a range of backgrounds a range of experiences a range of opinions um and all of that and i just i actually have another question but we'll see if we have time but on that one i just wondered whether you have any advice about reaching out to people um and getting a diverse sample in your show which is obviously really important but without it feeling tokenistic or out of place um for people like for example especially as a white cisgender woman um and i'm currently making a verbatim piece about gender and i've got a um non-binary person leading the workshops and making it alongside me as well but like they're also white so I just wondered what whether you have any 
thoughts on that about getting lots of different opinions but also actually giving back to people I think partnerships are key so forming partnerships really really early on when you're first started about making the work you can help you find the participants that you need yeah. so working with I don't know charities where there are like rainbow noir uh, rainbow noir and things like that who are people of color and um lg lgbt yeah um just for example um and sort of community champions people are active in community groups that you want to reach they are the best way rather than you trying to go in cold into those communities and everyone's like who the fuck are you yeah, yeah, yeah. um get people who are influential on your side okay. and what's it influence the influencers basically cool thank you yeah you, you need allies, you need help with things like this. Mm -hmm. um, so my other question was just sort of what you said about um, not making your, being wary of your piece becoming um, a series of talking heads and also giving the audience something visually um, to work with. And you made the example of behaviour, so like in the interview setting, how were they behaving and like recreating that. Um, but kind of where my work has been is in almost in juxtaposing the two things, not necessarily like direct opposition, but sometimes having sound or having the words, but having something that's visual, whether it's different or supports it. And I just wondered whether you had any thoughts on that and sort of navigating that whilst that whole thing of staying true to people's words and the responsibility you have to portray their words in a truthful way and not in a way that takes it out of context, um, but also being quite brave in your edits? Ooh, I don't think I'm quite the person to answer that question. Mm -hmm. The people I've referred you to, I think, is Lung Theatre, who make a lot of verbatim work and who are a bit more bold in how they edit than I am. And, I think you do quite interesting things visually as well in terms of how things look on the stage. In same, same, different, up until kind of tech rehearsal in York Theatre Royal Studio, we were playing around with camcorders and doing real close-ups on people's either fingers or feet or faces as they're talking. So they might have been saying one thing with their words, but then their hands or something were saying something different. Yeah. But then the tech broke at about four o'clock in the afternoon. We've got a half seven show. So that just kind of just dis got discarded. Um, and then it wasn't reintroduced because our technician then kind of suffered a bereavement early on in the tour. So they went away and the director took over teching the show and we were trying to keep things as simple as possible. So we lost that side of it. Um, but that was, I don't know if it's quite juxtaposing like how you're suggesting. But no, that's, that's helpful thank you thing. cool thank you um do you recommend letting actors or other people involved in the creative process listen to the interview transcripts um in same same different people didn't actually listen to the actual interviews raw all they got were kind of the, the script which had kind of like this transcribed dialogue in it and you'd be amazed actually how much can be got just from the written page in terms of pauses um slangs repetitions um when people came back and listened or watched their scenes back they were like oh my god you have really got my mom or oh my god is that what i sound like um but other people like this practitioner is called Alecky Blythe but basically their whole practice is the interviews are played into the actors ears while they're performing live and the actors literally mimicking kind of the interview and how the person talks in the moment they're never given a script it's all done through earpieces so it kind of really depends um i think i held back on some of the transcripts so far for same same different because there was a lot of quite personal stuff that people didn't want sharing actually out into the world when it 
when it came to it. Um, so I kind of edited that stuff out and therefore only presented to the actors kind of what, what, the, what people were happy for strangers to know. Um, but if things are less sensitive, maybe, I don't know, maybe people can listen to the interviews or if an actor maybe was really, really struggling with a character and how to embody them and bring them to life, I might give them a sneaky listen to a transcript. Um, yeah, it depends situation by situation basis. How do you transcribe the text or edit the audio? Do you have someone else who specialises in this? Um, because I'm poor and on a budget and the Arts Council aren't super generous, I basically transcribed it all myself. It's arduous, it's tough, it's horrible. Um, if you can afford a minion to do it for you, or several minions, I recommend that. Um, editing audio, I think, is possibly slightly easier. I don't know. Um, I haven't ever edited audio kind of that way, but the people to talk to about that, if you're interested in kind of what that takes and how to do that, might be 20 stories high. They've made several verbatim shows with their young people. Um, one was on the BBC. Um, I told my mum I was going on an RE trip about women's experiences of abortion. We've also done tales from the MP3 as well. And they're very cool and are very kind of good at tech and stuff like that, all the stuff that I'm not good at. So if you needed tips about what software to use, etc., they would be good people to ask. And Julia and God, what's his name? The man. Keith, Keith Saha. There we go, sorry. Um Julia and Keith are really friendly, really supportive, always good for um supporting other artists. They were really helpful to me when I've been making work. Yeah. Do you want to say anything, last words, before before we close off? Just thank you very much for joining me on a super sweaty night and listening to what I have to say. Hope it wasn't too rambly. Hope it wasn't too fast. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Naomi, for, for being part of the Thanks for having program. me. And thank you for sharing your knowledge and um, your career journey. So thank you, everybody.